episode of Marketing Against the Grain, your show for marketing-minded people everywhere. I'm your host, Kit Bodner, CMO over at HubSpot, and joined, as always, by my friend and co-host, Kieran Flanagan, who's the CMO over at Zapier. And it's episode 100, baby! We made it, Kieran! And to celebrate episode 100, we are going to talk about the business strategies and acts that got us at HubSpot from a startup to a billion dollar revenue company. Kieran and I worked together at HubSpot for a long, long time. That's where we became friends. That's where we decided to start the pod. And we wanna talk all about the things that we learned together. And we're talking about the stages of how you build a billion dollar company. This is the stuff no one talks about. People talk about the tactics, they talk about the hacks. They never tell you what are the acts, as I like to call them, the different major stages to propel a business to grow. And then you need you need multiple of those acts to actually go from a startup to a billion dollar business. And we're gonna talk all about those today, Kieran, because you and I saw it firsthand. We're gonna use HubSpot as a lens in our time together at HubSpot to share some lessons learned and some really practical examples of the acts that you need to put together to build a billion dollar company. You ready for this? Let's go. So Kieran, I was at HubSpot for a few years before you. So I think I'm going to start with Act 1 and try to label Act 1 and and package everything up as an insider. And then I'd love your perspective as somebody who wasn't in the business yet to see if I missed anything or see if you interpreted any of that stuff differently. So for Act 1, and I consider Act 1 basically, you're starting this business and you're trying to get it to minimum $10 million, but Act 1 can take you even up to $100 million. And I think Act 1 took HubSpot close to $100 million in revenue. So Act 1 for HubSpot as a business was all about creating a category. Brian and Dermesh knew they wanted to build a business in the marketing technology category, but they didn't want to play in this existing category of marketing automation. So they created a category of inbound marketing. And we went through a big, deep category creation process where we wrote what was called the inbound marketing book. We defined ourselves as inbound marketing software. We had an inbound marketing blog. My very first job at HubSpot was I ran the inbound marketing blog and like grew that thing. And those plays were hugely, hugely important to the success of HubSpot because it differentiated us. And the thing that was magic was that we had a clear enemy. Like it was like, hey, you're doing outbound marketing. Outbound marketing is like, billboards and TV ads and yellow page ads. You got to remember, this was back when online marketing was in its infancy. And there was a clear dichotomy between the old way and the new way of doing something. And we offered people the new way. And having that very clear thought leadership positioning and then connecting it to the product was amazing. And then we had this unique way of going to market where we used inbound marketing, go to market. We used content, we'd use content offers, email marketing, blogs, all of these things that were very early days. And why I'm bringing this up is because I think with the next generation of AI and the, the period of the time of the next five years, I think there's gonna be a lot of new marketing strategies and tactics coming online over the next five years. And there's gonna be a lot of companies out there that are gonna be able to replicate the same playbook in a really useful way. But we had an inside sales model. We knew we were selling high transaction kind of deals where we were selling 5K a year deals, 10K a year deals. And so because of that, we needed a high volume of leads and demand coming in. And that had to happen through our inbound marketing motion. And so we became experts at search engine optimization, conversion rate optimization. And Kieran, you and I have talked about this on the show before, but we had Paid and search is two channels that really worked for us to bring in and drive demand. And those two channels were really how we scaled the business in the early days. And so the last thing I would say is as part of the category creation, we had that inbound marketing book and man, we went on the road and any place there was 20, 30, 40, 100 marketers gathered, we showed up and we like, we preached the good word of inbound marketing. And it was this long indoctrination. And now like everybody uses the term inbound marketing. It's a, it's a colloquialism, but that was not the case, you know, 15 years ago. And things really took five years to change. And, and when we talk about acts in a business and stages of a business's growth, like an act is, it's a good five years. And Kieran, before I kick it over you, what reminded me and what jogged us to kind of do this episode is I was talking to a founder that I work with, yeah, yesterday. 
and he and he was like, oh, I want to talk to you about like the end game of this business. And I was like, I don't want to talk about the end game of the business. I want you to tell me how many stages and acts and the vision you have for this business. And then we can know what the true potential of this business is. And that's what I think any founder or any leader of a business should be thinking about when they're building their business. That first act, there's a couple of things that really matter that you solve a problem that people agree is a problem in the world. For HubSpot, that problem was, how do you continue to grow your business in the world where the internet is exploding in popularity? So like they kind of rode the trend of the internet that was shifting the way that people marketed their business. How do you solve that problem in a differentiated way? Like inbound was the differentiated transformational message. And so to me, it's really important that a brand has a strong point of view from the founder. And that founder can kind of talk about, hey, this is the problem we solve. This is why it matters. And this is why we're solving it in a differentiated world. And this is how it makes our customers happy. The other thing that's somewhat unique to HubSpot, like the other part of that, I would say is like problem solve problem in a differentiated way. It should actually translate into how your product solves our problem. The other part of any business who's trying to build the act one is to try to find a scalable channel. And I think in the future, mm -hmm. we'll probably do an episode where we talk about some of the best businesses and how they just grew from a singular channel. But the one thing that was slightly different around HubSpot's growth is the way that they grew awareness of the brand, like around inbound was also how they grew demand for the business. Because yes. the more HubSpot did inbound marketing and talked about how it was doing inbound marketing to grow the business, the more that actually helped their brand and help the brand of HubSpot and the awareness of HubSpot around inbound. And those two things are very unique. Like a lot of the times when you're doing the brand part and trying to get people to be more aware of the, the brand and the product and how you sell something in a differentiated way, it's not how you're growing demand. It's not how you're necessarily growing demand for the product, right? Yeah. It's not how you're actually getting customers to come in and use the product. And I think that was like really unique. Like the, just doing the marketing was part of how HubSpot grew the brand. I think that's a brilliant insight. I think when you're in the middle of something, when you're in the thick of something, it's really hard to have any perspective on it. So it's like, how do you know if you're on to the right thing? It's actually really, really hard, right? You and I have talked about this a lot. And I think there are a lot of people who are out there building companies right now. And they're like, I don't know, I think I'm doing the right thing, but how do I really know? And what we want to do in today's show is try to give you some kind of goalposts on the, on the journey to say like, oh yeah, I am doing that. So I'm probably on the right thing. One of the things that Brian Halligan, who's founder and longtime CEO of HubSpot, would always tell you and I, Karen, is like, we have to break the tyranny of war. And that's what you were just talking about. Most companies, they go out and they have a brand team that drives awareness and they have a demand team that goes and drives demand. And they have this big gap in between the two of them, right? Which is like, oh, am I going to focus on brand awareness or demand. And the genius of, of the original inbound marketing strategy is it broke the tyranny of or because it wasn't an or it was we did both the same thing drove brand awareness and drove demand. And so if you're in a situation building a company, if you are breaking that tyranny of or that is a very, very good sign that you are on the right path and you kind of have captured magic in a bottle to actually make that happen. And if you find yourself in the opposite situation where you've got very disparate teams working on very different things, not really that aligned, then you kind of know, well, oh, maybe we don't have it right now and I need to make some real changes to get there. And the other thing I will say that is really important in that first act for people who want to really excel in that first act is understanding how your business grows. Like HubSpot was always very diligent yes. about the go-to-market and understanding how the go-to-market worked and what are the main metrics and what are the core drivers and what are the leading indicators. Like always from when I joined the company, go-to-market and understanding how your go-to-market worked and where were the levers that you needed to pull to make that go-to-market better was always really, really important. And I think businesses in general need to be really diligent about that because you can't try to move the needle on all metrics. You can only try to like move the needle on the ones that truly matter. And I think that's really important for that first act. I, I totally agree. And I, there's kind of two points and two stories that I want to tell people around, around this first act. First of all, if you are a CMO or you're a leader of marketing out there and you're, you're in this kind of first act, this early stage of a business, one of the things you have to do is hold people to the plan. Like I remember Kieran, Mike Volpe, who's shout out Mike, who was the first CMO of HubSpot. 
the whole marketing team, myself included, were like, oh, well, if we go write about like marketing automation or SEO or all these topics, we're going to get more leads than if we just talk about inbound marketing. And he was like, no, but we have to teach people about inbound marketing. And you have to go and teach people about inbound marketing and stay focused on that topic. And so part of the job of a marketing leader in that early stage is to keep everybody focused on the plan and knowing that plan and that message isn't going to resonate for a long time. And we are going to make that message resonate by brute force. And if you don't keep doing the brute force, you're not going to get there. So that's that's one. And then the second one was around pricing and packaging, Kieran, which I think is really important. And shout out to our friend Brad Coffey, who ran pricing packaging at HubSpot for a long time. One of the most transformative moments in act one for HubSpot was a period of time that we called Mary Mofu monetization. And what that means is those are three areas of strategic focus. We had this internal debate of like, oh, should we focus on the very small businesses or should we focus on marketers in the mid-market? And we called the marketers in the mid-market Marketing Mary. And eventually we said, you know what? We have to focus on Marketing Mary in the mid-market. So that's what we did. And that strategic clarity, really, really valuable. The second thing we said is like, we looked at the product, right, here, and we looked at the product experience. We looked what was really going to retain and be a deep, sticky use case for people that we could build a high retention subscription business on. And we realized those were automation features, email automation, workflow automation. And so we went and we acquired a company called Performable, transformed our product to, to focus all on automation. And that was completely game changer in act one of the business. And then monetization, we changed our pricing model. We had what was called a single axis pricing model. So you could have, I think the very first HubSpot pricing model was t-shirt sizes, small, medium, and large. You know, it's like, it's like the Swag. worst pricing model ever. But then Brad over overhauled that to kind of, to have, at the time it was basic professional and enterprise, but he added a second pricing axis, which was for our case, contacts. How many contacts were in your marketing database that you were trying to email and market to? And depending on the number of contacts, your price changed. And if you did inbound marketing really well and you got more leads and got more demand and more contacts, you would pay HubSpot more over time. Those three changes, those business strategy changes were transformative in act one. You put those together with really clear category creation and a really unique way to drive demand and brand awareness. And we were able to build a $100 million software company basically off those strategies. There's one that I wanted to touch on again, because I do think it's really important for people who are listening to this and they're trying to build that act one. But if I go through what we talked about, it's like solve a problem, solve a problem in a differentiated way solve that through your product, like your product should fulfill the promise that you have, find scalable acquisition channels. There is a part of what you just said, which is like, have the confidence to build the brand, which is really have the confidence to do things that are yeah. seem non-impactful right now and are not measurable right now, because like building the brand of inbound marketing likely didn't equate to a lot of demand or didn't get reflected in the go-to-market metrics somewhat more unmeasurable. Like how do we know we're building the brand of inbound? You kind of get the feeling in certain ways, but how do we truly know we're building this brand? And so most people in the first act are going to be under pressure for the measurable go-to-market metrics, right? Yeah. And we talked about the stack rank, the power rank of the most important things over the next six most yeah. important marketing strategies. But go check out the power rankings episode. Go, go check out the power rankings, but brand, brand, a sneak peek brand is number one. But why then why are most founders going to struggle with a team that is telling them, hey, like we need to like invest in this brand thing and we've got this. You may not see it in the kind of core go-to-market metrics. It's really important. We can give you the leading indicators that this is working, mm -hmm. aided and unaided awareness and brand and branded search and all these different things. But like, what are we telling people who are trying to struggle with that conversation with their CEO and their founder right now? I think what we're telling them is that you're gonna struggle with your CEO, your CFO, your founder on any marketing strategies that are longer lead time. And brand has happens to be a longer lead time strategy where it takes six, 12 months and longer to really build real brand. And so what I would tell you is kind of how we handled this in the in the early days of HubSpot. I think it's still very possible. It's like we had a real point of view that allowed us to, to drive some brand awareness in market. We did an inbound marketing content had led playbook that allowed us to generate leads. And when you're an early stage business, I think what happens is I think you can spend most of your money on direct response 
advertising, and it's still going to generate awareness for you. My one tip for you, Karen, and you and I have talked all about this lots of time. Basically, here was the early stage HubSpot marketing playbook. We're going to run some paid ads on Google and Facebook and such. We're going to get a lot of traffic to our blogs and convert those folks to our blogs and our websites into leads. And we're going to do one other thing. That's really how we're going to drive brand awareness. And brand awareness wasn't this big campaign. It was how we are going to win the internet that week. Right. What is the thing we are going to do? In our case, we were trying to reach marketers. What is the thing we're going to do that gets all the marketers on the internet talking and talking about us that week? And when you take that win the internet that week mindset, it really shifts it to be a much more immediate, tangible benefit. And it gets the emotion. Like, Founders and CEOs don't react well to like these long, big brand campaigns. They act, they react really well to like all this love that they're getting on Twitter or what have you from people saying how amazing this thing that you did in the here and now and that week went, right? And then that gets them amped up to want to go and do that again and again and again. And I think right. that's the magic of, of what you have to do. Yeah, I think that makes a ton of sense. If you are the founder who believes that you can grow only on performance marketing tactics and don't need to invest in brand or don't need to have a point you're of wrong. view, then yeah, you're going to be, you're not going to make the second act. Like no. we can get into the second act, but you won't have a second. Well, act. Yeah. We're getting the second act in a minute, but, but Kira, before we get the second act, do you know what a meat cute is? A meat cute? Do you know what a meat cute is? I don't. Producer Darren does. So he knows where I'm going with this. So a meat cute is a saying in, in TV and movies. It is when two people first meet each other. And it's the device in which two people meet each other. So let's say a man and a woman meet each other for the first time and they're walking down the street in New York. They bump into each other. They both drop their, their <laughs> stuff and they're both carrying the same magazine. And they're like, oh, oh, I love this magazine. You love this magazine. And they start talking and there's, you know, something happens and now they have a connection between the two of them. And in the film and TV world, that's called a meet cute. I think we should tell everybody watching the equivalent of our meet cute to the start of our friendship, which was a lunch interview in Dublin, Ireland, because that kind of happened at kind of midway through the first act of HubSpot. And so before we go to the second act, we got to talk about like how we met, how that all happened. I think you should tell your perspective and I should tell my perspective. And I think it'll be pretty funny how we saw that situation differently. Well, I was working at this tiny little company that people wouldn't have heard of before called Marketo. <laughs> <laughs> yes. One, one and, of yeah. HubSpot's four competitors at the time, yep. <laughs> and and so I, Mike and Kip flew over for the interview. I was really excited. That was, it was like coming from Ireland where they're just back then, US tech companies even having a presence in Dublin were starting to become much more common, but not that common. And so I had watched HubSpot from afar. So I was really excited. I was like, oh, there's Mike and Kip and I watched you guys on HubSpot TV. I was like one of the 10 people that watched you on that. <laughs> it, was, it was like 100 people a week, I think, watched HubSpot TV. It was a very, very early YouTube live show, which was hilarious. So so this was the first time I'd, I'd, I'd ever gone to Dublin, Ireland. I think probably the first time I've ever been to Europe, honestly. And so I'm I'm on a flight with my friend and boss at the time, Mike, and we're, we're going over there. And, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because Kieran was our first marketer outside of the United States. And so we were going to open an office in Dublin, and we wanted to basically find somebody to lead marketing for us for all of Europe. And so we go and we, we have a few few people we talk to. And and this is like pre-gentrification Dublin, Kieran. Like I still remember like as before they painted away all the graffiti, like it was awesome. I was like, this is, <laughs> this is like Dublin now is like kind of watered down and kind of like post-tech boom Dublin. This was like <laughs> gritty, artsy, like it was like, it was one of my favorites. Before moments. you Americans came in with their money. <laughs> before, and... before we totally gentrified and ruined <laughs> Dublin. It was, you know, it was awesome. And so the thing that Mike and I talked about was like, oh, he's he's working at Marketo and he's got this like non-compete. Are we going to be able to hire him? Because they're going to like... <laughs> I wasn't going to bring this up because I didn't know. I was actually going to say that and I didn't know what to say because I didn't know if they could still come after me. So <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the statute is gone, right? It's pretty gone by now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and so we were like, well, if we if we go with this person, like there's there's real risk that like, we could hire this person. And he like actually couldn't start and do this job. And so it was like, it was a real debate. And then we had this lunch and you and I talked about ketchup. I think we had burgers. I forget. We, we, were, we, we had a great time. It was lunch at some weird random restaurant in, in along the river in Dublin. And finally, I was like, I think Mike and I had talked and was like, oh man, Kieran, like he's willing to take this risk. And it's like, if he's willing to take this risk and like, 
maybe be without a job because he'd rather he wants to work with us so much then like why wouldn't we want to work with him and like that was kind of like the whole conversation and it turns out that you were able to actually take the job and you and I started working together and the rest is history and we had like the best time ever doing marketing for a long long time and now we're doing the pod but that was our meet cute that is how we met initially my very first trip to Europe and it was you know the other wild. the only other funny thing about that the thing Mike really liked because he brought it up to me a couple of times was do you remember I don't know how I included this in my interview was like I had the sneaker website and I had the sneaker YouTube channel. And I remember Mike was like one of the first marketing meetings I attended. He was like, and this guy has like hundreds of thousand people watching him try on shoes. Cause I had this like YouTube, me and my brother had this yeah. like YouTube fashion site or a fashion site yeah. and we did this YouTube channel and we would try on shoes. I think I told the story before and we would twirl around and they would get like quarter of a million views just us trying on sneakers and we got sent tons of sneakers to try on and he's like this is what marketing is it's like trying things experiment it's like oh that's pretty cool that mike remembers my like well, no, one, one of the things one of the things i learned from mike and one of the pieces of advice i'd give this is not a hiring episode but this is like part of act one is like hiring really great people who can really build and help you build this business and when it comes to marketers the thing i learned the most from from mike was like he would literally talk to anybody that had an audience Right. Didn't it matter? Like, oh, this person has a great Pinterest account. This person has a great TikTok. Like what? Like you pick the account and how they had an audience. And like, he'd be like, oh, I have to talk to them. You know, like, I want to know how they did that. And if they can do that for themselves, like there's a decent chance they can help us do that. Right. And it was like that way of thinking. And, and I think you and I learned that a lot from him is like, oh, audience development and creation is so scarce that if somebody has the, the kind of magic DNA to do that, we want to work with them. We want to bring them in. Right. Yeah. And so I think that's one of the things that you and I have in common is we both have that gene. You were good at figuring out systems and how to game them. Right. And so am I. Scalable. And that's one of the one of the things that we we bond over to this day. OK, so that's a little side story of the Kip and Kira meet cute. It's like we haven't really talked about it on the pod. And Kira, you kind of came on the second part of of the first act of HubSpot and the internationalization story was a big part of that. And we started internationalizing beyond just English and all of those things. But then we get to act two. And act two for me at HubSpot starts, starts about 2014. And Kieran, you had a front seat to HubSpot Act 2 of our growth. And I would love to hear your point of view on that. I feel like I went, I did the start of Act 1. What, what's your take on what were the key parts of Act 2? Yeah, I think the one we're going to talk about, right, is the classic innovator's dilemma, like disrupt yourself before you get disrupted. And a lot, a lot of businesses are about to go through this because of AI, Tons. right? Like, how, how do I disrupt my own business with AI before someone, a startup, disrupts me first? And so HubSpot and Brian Halligan had started this project called Sidekick. Was Sidekick the first iteration or Signals? It was Sidekick was the yeah. first iteration. And, and so I like shiny objects. And so I remember I, I was helping to grow the international business. And I got to hear about the Sidekick project from you and some other people. And it was this really cool group of people, Brian Balfour, Mike Peachy, Mark Roberts, C Talk, Christopher Donald. Like if you look like at who was running that product, like squad. they are now like some of the squad, most successful like, sales and marketing product people in the world. It's right. crazy. They were, they were, and then the people they had on that team, like Anum, Scott Tyus, like just unbelievable, unbelievable squad of people. And so I was like, oh, this is super cool. <laughs> and so like one, of, and so first of all, HubSpot set it up as like, okay, like we are going to be disrupted by product led growth. Like we really believe in the consumerization yeah. of software. We should actually start to disrupt ourselves before we actually have an upstart comes in with a better kind of customer experience, go to market, much more product led than us. You know, some, someone asked me recently for some of the things that Brian Halligan is truly amazing at. And one of the things I have is like, He's the right amount of American, but he has like a right amount of Irish in him because he has like great <laughs> explain, paranoia. Explain. He's like the, oh, he's the most paranoid person I've ever met. Yeah, and that's like that's what. So he's got the par paranoia, but the this is true. Just so everyone knows, every time I talk to Kieran, yeah. the sky is falling. The world could not be worse, <laughs> and he, his his whole life is going to go away, and he's going to live in a van down yeah, by the river. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to live in a mud hut. So <laughs> I, I see the opportunities with AI, but I also gravitate towards all of the bad things that are going to happen with AI. <laughs> that's just, this that's is just true. me. Our WhatsApp uh, thread will verify that. Yeah. So Brian, I think Brian has that mix. Like you would say that he's the right amount 
kind of opportunistic. Like he looks forward, he's really visionary and looks forward to the future and figures out how to build, but he's the right amount of paranoia. And uh, really an innovator's dilemma is kind of like the paranoia part. Like how do I make sure I disrupt myself before yeah, I get the, disrupted? The, the, the saying around this for everybody is a Steve Jobs quote, right? That only the paranoid survive. Like only the paranoid survive. And that is like what you're pushing on here is that Brian embodied that at the start of the second act where we'd had some success, but we wanted to see much greater success instead of see that first act of success kind of go away. So what happened was that crew learned a lot about product-led growth and the way HubSpot did it is very unique. And I think a lot of businesses can learn from that. They said, go do your thing. And the core business will leave you alone and not even ask you for update. Like you are a separate entity. Do you think that was the right call? Like, would you recommend for people listening and watching the show, like to do a similar, similar strategy? I think it has pros and cons. I think the pro is you have much more freedom to do riskier and bigger things. I think if you didn't have that freedom, you would get dragged into like, oh, well, like it's not really how we would do things. It's not really the way we do things. Whereas that team just like built an entire go-to-market and you you go to market that was very different from HubSpot. It was like much more consumer oriented, small product, land and expand, like find one individual and try to onboard their entire team. They learned a ton about product qualified leads. The con is I joined when Brian Balfour, who's incredible, went went and started Reforged. That kind of crew disbanded and we brought it back into HubSpot. And my task was like to be part of the group to build product-led growth across HubSpot's go-to-market, like take those learnings. And so the pulling of that back in- Was miserable. Miserable. The first year, <laughs> dude, the biggest, <laughs> we can leave, hopefully we can leave this in. I joined and one of the things that, here's my other tip, like this, it's like none of, you know, one of the ones that no one will really talk about, don't build your own, only build your own tool in if you really need to. So what that team yeah. had built was like their own version of Amplitude. Mm-hmm. And that was like really hard because we pulled that back in and then you have like, you have to support a tool that runs the business and you have like two product teams, one building the product, one managing the tool in to actually run the product. So a lot of that is miserable, but then we brought it back in and we built the kind of product led growth engine. And I think one of the things that we got right was figuring out again, how this business should grow. So Brian really had a lasting impact on how people did business. Like when I joined, Brian had an incredible growth model. Yeah, Balfour is a great growth model leader, right? Yeah, and I was like, coming from an engineering background, I remember when he first gave me the growth model, I was like, I just, I'm literally in heaven. <laughs> like the best thing that's ever happened to me is like, Brian had mapped out like every driver of every cust- every stage of customer journey, all of the leading indicators, how they grow each and every month or how they're growing each and every week. And so you could start to see like, oh, wow, if we're not going to, that leading indicator, if we don't start to make real progress against that metric, we're going to be unsuccessful. And so the thing we really started on to begin with is like, okay, we need to figure out quali- product qualified leads. And so we really figured out where is the first place to start. So how do we actually grow users, freemium users, and how do we actually qualify them into demand for the sales team? And we iterated through a bunch of that. The last thing we actually really moved the needle on was user and team activation. And there's great product growth teams that actually did a lot of great work there. And what I've realized from my experience since then to today is user activation, team activation, the activation metrics are some of the hardest to move the needle on because it's, it's really, how do you onboard someone into the value? How do you get them to really internalize that value, understand that value, in some respects, share that value with others? But they're actually the most meaningful metrics you can move the needle. If you move the needle in those, they have a meaningful impact oh, on huge. the business. The other couple of things I'll just go through in terms of what might be interesting for people in that second act is, you're usually, if you're doing something like that, it's kind of very new. Back then, PLG wasn't even that well-known in, in the industry. So we were learning and we didn't have a lot of people or things to learn from. And so what I did was I tried to have as many conversations with any other PLG companies that we could learn from. Great advice. I remember, yeah, I remember Halligan set me up with Drew from Dropbox. Dropbox. Yeah. And so we we got connected to anyone like Jay from Alassian, like anyone who was Jay Simons, anyone who was like actually skilled and experienced, we got connected, talked to those. Building the team was really hard because there wasn't a lot of experience in the market. So we really leaned into people who were smart who could solve problems, who were extremely motivated, who were coachable, who could just go after a problem. Because again, they weren't coming in with, oh, here's how we did it at the previous company. They were just coming in with, I'll figure it out. And I think that's a good lesson, even for for me, I should remind myself of that is the most successful people, I think some of the most successful people in that PLG business learned how to do PLG in that business, right? They weren't coming in with like, we've seen the playbook before. 
I've done it before and I fall into that trap. I'm falling, probably falling into that trap now. I was like, I can name a bunch of people who are incredible and that was their first time trying to build a product-led growth business. Well, um, but, 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 but before you go on, you just said what I think is one of the greatest growth hacks in HubSpot history, which is, and I want to give people a little bit more detail. It's like, Brian is the most intellectually honest, curious person I've ever met. And he just always wants to learn from people, right? And so one of the things we would do is we would have what we call field trips. And we would say, hey, here's a topic, product-led growth, for example. And we want to know everything we could possibly know about this. And so we would line up in the course of a couple of days, 10 different people, like the people, right. the 10 people who knew the most about this topic. And what's interesting is every time we did that, everybody would always remark of, and be like, oh, this is really cool that you guys do this. More people should do this. You know, we should do this. I don't know why we don't do this. And it turns out nobody does it. And no it also turns it. out, if you go to somebody and say, hey, I think you are amazing the best in the world at this thing. And I would love some for some of our team to just spend one hour of our time with you and we will do whatever, we will we will meet you wherever you want. We will do it whenever, whatever is convenient for you. Everybody almost always says yes because people are so flattered by that. And, and it's like pandering to the, the best and worst parts of humanity, you know? And that growth hack was transformational, right? Completely, completely transformational. The tech industry is actually, I know it's got a lot of egos in it, but it's really supportive. And the notes that we used to share from conversations, Ugh. everyone on Slack was like, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> like people love those notes. And that's why I, my first, very first podcast was about product growth. I did about 190 interviews specifically to just learn, like learn yes. how people are actually doing this. And so anytime someone has asked me on my team, it's like, oh, I'm trying to get better. I really want to be better at this. I want to want to master these things. I'm always like, how many conversations have you had this month with people who are good at that? None. It's like, but you're not. You're not going to get better. That's yeah, it. Yeah, it's the way, that. This is the way to learn. Like, talk to people and be someone people want to talk to. First um, party research. We vilified research as like just this thing that you go do. No, it's like go do research for yourself and use that to get better at the skills you're trying to build. Wow, does that change your life? I don't ask chat GPT. It's not the same. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's definitely not the same. Yeah. Okay, so you just walked us through the entire kind of product-led growth story. And, but I, I want to package up the second act because we're, we're getting deep into the pod here and I want to make sure we, we get everything covered. The second act of HubSpot was we moved from a single product marketing to multiple products where we added a sales product then subsequently a customer success and service product and so forth. And if you were going to have a second act of any business out there, you're gonna likely need to go from one or a few products or service offerings to many. And the magic that I think HubSpot said is like, oh, we're gonna do this hard thing of creating another product line. We should do it in a way that's going to actually help us. We have this beginner's advantage of starting this thing from scratch. Let's do it in a different way with product-led growth. Have a freemium business model, try to disrupt the existing sales category by commoditizing the low end of that market down to free. It was like, it was a very clear and thoughtful strategy that worked very, very well. At the same time, Brian knew that to have a great product-led motion, we had to have a great product organization. And he started in changing the percent of revenue that we invested in research and development in, in our product organization and increasing it and taking it away from other parts of the business and building up that organization. And he wanted it for two reasons, not just to have a great product-led motion, but to also have a really high product NPS. How do you have great word of mouth? How do you have an amazing product that people love using, that your customers find really valuable? And that investment in the product organization was transformative for the word of mouth of HubSpot and the adoption of HubSpot. So if you think about it, multi-product, NPS investment, and then product-led growth were really the three catalysts to the second act of HubSpot success. There's a lot of other stuff in there. We haven't even talked about the people and culture side of this. We'll have to bring Katie on at some point to just go into that because that's like its whole other conversation. But that's a big part of it. Would you agree that the first, the first second act, one of the big metrics that needs that is the core focus is net dollar retention? Like I feel like oh yeah, net dollar retention is every like positive net dollar retention is everything 
in terms of that second act. Like that is the metric people well, need to start to cross. Yeah, so that, that's the right articulation. So this, this is a little bit more in the weeds for any technology or software companies. But the reason that most companies go from a single product to multi-product is so that they can cross sell and upsell their customer base, right? I think that's what you're getting at. And the benefit of that is you have what's called positive revenue retention, where you have more dollars that are upgraded than then are canceled or downgraded. Right? right. And so tell people kind of what that cross sell upsell motion looks like and how's that works and how and how you all thought about that in like the early days of of a multi-product world, Karen. Yeah, it's it, it's very much like land and expand. So what we did was we tried to get people started. We tried to get sales reps started on sales acceleration tools and then we would land and we would expand into the sales manager and get them to see all of the reports for the sales reps and the CRM, like shift from single user case to team user case and look for those signals. Like we did regression analysis, look for the signals that would suggest someone was gonna be a happy customer and make sure that we tried to onboard the sales reps onto those things and then figure out the signals to actually get that account to raise its hand and say, oh, like we have a bunch of people who are using your tool. They're really happy, they're getting value. We wanna to talk to you about some of the team features you have. And then the cross sell is somewhat similar in that you're looking for, that's when you have to start to actually figure out like, do I have the buyer committee in? Mm -hmm. Like the right buyer committee? Like I go in through a single product, I start with my individual use case, my team use case, and then I'm like, okay, well, who are the other people I can get access to, you know, through the data that I have? And, and the big thing about the upsell and the cross sell is you are just trying to get your net dollar, you are trying to get more money from the accounts that you have versus the money you're losing from the people who are churning out of your product, right? So people leave your product, you lose revenue, but I'm actually building more revenue from the existing accounts I have because they are buying more product and they are buying product for their teams and company. And that really is the entire strategy in that phase. I think that's a great summary and that's really a core catalyst of act two. Before we leave, you know, I think great, great businesses are, have at least three acts. And, you know, so HubSpot now is in its third act, which is going from multi-product to a platform business that, you know, is a truly international business. It's really kind of the scale up of act two. And we, we'll talk all about that on, an, on, on a future show. I think the zero to a billion dollar plays were really the, the things we wanted to cover today. And what we're really saying is that was really two acts because like acts are a long period of time, right? They're like five to eight years. And in this case, they were each about seven, seven years in, in the HubSpot example. And what was really clear is there were really only like three or four big, big strategies over the course of that period of time, right? Because it one of the things we talked about on the show, Kieran, is it takes a long time. Like how long did it take to get the product-led motion working? 216 to 220. Yeah, four to really five years to, to, yeah. to really get, so like it works in that meantime, but to really get cranking and really get scaled up, it takes a long period of time, right? Find product market fit for the products, find product market fit for the go-to-market, build scalable channels, build scalable PQL motions, build scalable upgrade motions, like all that stuff takes time. And, and how many glasses of wine in Dublin restaurants did it take for us to get there? Many a wine did we have to drink to <laughs> navigate the hard, the hard complexity of the complexity <laughs> of PLG. No, but in, in, in all seriousness, what we wanted to try to do for everybody today is take you behind the scenes, give you kind of the real talk, the real story of how you actually build a business. And you build a business off of really clear strategic insights that you have great people working and executing on for a real sustained period of time. It's not a six month thing, it's not a 12 month thing. It is a grind. The amount of times, Kieran, you and I talk, talk to each other and are just like, ah, oh, we know the right thing, we just have to grind it out. Like that's basically what we say to each other constantly and that's what we're telling everybody here is do not forget that even when you're right, it takes a long time for it to really come together and help build that business in a really remarkable way. That is today's episode of Marketing Against the Grain. Please subscribe on YouTube. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a comment on YouTube. We'd love to hear what you thought, any questions you have, things you think we left out of today's episode. And we will see you real soon on Marketing Against the Grain. This data is wrong every freaking time. Have you heard of HubSpot? HubSpot is a CRM platform where everything is fully integrated. Whoa, I can see the client's whole history, calls, support tickets, emails, and here's a task from three days ago I totally missed. HubSpot. Grow better.